It has stopped raining in Pittsburgh, where the best road team in baseball, the Chicago Cubs, send Greg Maddox after win number 18 as they try to maintain their seemingly solid lead in the NL East. And at Fenway, the Red Sox broke an eight-game losing streak last night, beating the A's, but Oakland still leads Kansas City and California by three and a half games. Hello, everybody. Welcome to our NBC studios in New York. I'm Gail Gardner, in for Marv Albert. Ahead today, could Wrigley finally be the home of champions? We will speak with Cubs manager Don Zimmer. And we'll take you to the offices of the new baseball commissioner. Our conversation with Faye Vincent coming up. There is, though, one game going on right now in the majors in Toronto. The Jays starting the day with a meager game-and-a-half lead over the Orioles. They have Dave Steve in search of his 15th win against Cleveland. And right now, Joe Carter has hit a solo home run, his 33rd of the season, a career high for him. And the Indians lead Toronto one to nothing. Of course, the closest race continues in the AL East, where both the Jays and the Orioles were winners last night. In Toronto, Ozzy Virgil facing Indian starter Greg Swindell. Only the eighth plate appearance for Virgil since his recall from AAA. The two-run homer to left. Toronto over Cleveland 5-2. Jays lead the Orioles by game and a half in the East. In Baltimore, both fans asking why not. And the Birds keeping pace with the Jays. Craig Worthington, the RBI single in the sixth, snapping a 2-2 tie. Goes over the Royals 5-2. Casey tied with the Angels, three and a half back of Oakland in the West. The A's starting a key 10-game road trip last night at Fenway. Roger Clemens shutting them down. He struck out seven in his first win over Oakland in over three years. Red Sox snapping an eight-game losing streak. The final was 7-2. National League at Candlestick. Benito Santiago connecting off giant starter Bob Nepper. Two-run homer in the sixth, giving him seven homers in his last 25 games. Paz over the Giants 5-3. They pulled to within five of the Western leading Giants. And to the East, the Cubs refused to back down, making it six straight wins. Sean Dunstan with the big blow, his first career grand slam coming in a five-run six. Cubs over the Bucks 7-2. Rick Sutcliffe becoming the Cubs' third 15-game winner. Cubs now lead the second-place Mets by five and a half with only 15 games left. It is September 16th, and there are two weeks left in the baseball season. The Cubs are in first place. And if you are a Cubs fan, you know you're almost afraid to say that out loud. 81 years, the longest world championship drought in baseball, even worse than their American League friend in futility, the Boston Red Sox. And joining us now, a man who has known both those teams well, former Red Sox, Padres, Rangers, and present-day Cubs manager, Don Zimmer. And Don, I think, first of all, Jim Fry bringing you to Chicago in 1987. There were cries of cronyism at the time. I know you were a bit upset because you thought that people didn't have much regard for your 40 years in baseball. But basically, do you feel at least a little bit vindicated now? Well, Gail, you know, uh, the whole story was when Jim became the general manager that my name would be as a candidate to manage the Cubs. And when he finally hired me, uh, all I heard was that he hired me because I was his high school buddy and this and that. Uh, you know, I, I don't know whether people realize it or not, but I did manage nine years in the major leagues before Jim ever hired me. And for people to even think that way, uh, I just, I thought it was unfair. But Jim Fry got a big job being the general manager of the Cubs. He hired me because uh, I, he thought that I could do the job. And j being buddies uh, just uh, adds a little icing to the cake. There was always a general belief with the Cubs because of their history that somehow, somewhere, the roof is going to cave in. How have you been able to basically deal with that skepticism? Well, you know, I can go back to almost at the All-Star break when we were playing in St. Louis, and some writer walked into my office one day. I didn't know him. And his first question was, well, it's getting near August. Uh, when will the Cubs fold? I said, I don't know nothing about that. I wasn't with the Cubs in 1969, and my players wasn't with the Cubs in 1969. This is 89, and I got a bunch of hungry guys here, and they have just played outstanding baseball and have played as hard as they could play all year, and uh, this is why we're where we're at today. All right, Don, thank you for spending some time with us. Continued success to you and the Cubs this year. Don Zimmer and Jim Fry, of course, good friends for a long time. And when we return, another story of friendship that is affecting the present and the future of baseball. A conversation with new commissioner Faye Vincent right after this. For a quick tour through the news of the week, which includes a firing and a bunch 
of seasonal first. Tuesday in Chicago, the Cubs' Ryan Sandberg hit his 30th homer. Sandberg became the first second baseman to belt 30 or more homers in a season since Bobby Gritch did it back in 1979. Now, also on Tuesday, we got the answer to the question, what's up, Doc? It certainly wasn't Cleveland manager Doc Edwards. The Indians firing Edwards, replacing him with organizational scout John Hart on an interim basis. Thursday, Houston Astros' Mike Scott became the first 20-game winner in the majors this season. It is only the fourth time an Astros pitcher has won 20 or more games. And speaking of first, the Minnesota Twins' Jeff Reardon recorded his 30th save of the year, thus becoming the first pitcher in the history of baseball to register 30 or more saves in five consecutive seasons. Of course, the big story this week was the naming of Faye Vincent to succeed his close friend Bart Giamatti as commissioner of baseball. He will complete the four and a half years Giamatti had left to serve before his untimely death on September 1st. Faye Vincent, a lover of baseball with a sharp mind for business and administration. During his 10 years as head of Columbia Pictures, he gave us such films as Gandhi, The Big Chill, Tootsie, and Ghostbusters. And to understand why the often at odds owners would rally so quickly and so unanimously behind him is to understand how much respect he commands. Yesterday was his first day back in his New York office as the commissioner of baseball, and we had a chance to spend some time with him and cover a lot of ground, both work-related and personal. He, of course, had the option not to take the position as commissioner. I asked him first why he did decide to accept the job. I once used the word job, and Bart told me that jobs were things you did with your muscles. Uh, so I really uh, am careful about using the word since he uh, zinged me about it. I, I took it because uh, I think it's a wonderful challenge, because I love baseball, because I think it's probably the right thing for me to do, and also because I think Bart would have been happy for me to do it. Uh, I talked to Tony, his wife, and she encouraged me to do it. So it was not that close a call. What are some of the specifics of the agenda that uh, you and Bart had over the course of the five years in this office? The social agenda was um, included things like a major commitment on affirmative action. He felt very strongly that baseball should do a better job in that area, and we will. Uh, he was very concerned about the ambiance of the ballpark, the experience that the fans had when they came to a game and he was concerned about improving that and we have improved it and we will do more uh, in that area he was interested in helping players in their future lives he thought he might be instructive in uh, education and in counseling uh, that's very difficult because there's been resistance to uh, any interference uh, in that area but bart thought he might accomplish something there and we will try Drugs, of course, have been very much in the news the past week. What are your own feelings about the responsibility of this sport to its players in regard to drug problems? And the first step, I think, is to find out more about the extent of the problem. Uh, how big is it? Uh, or how little is it? And then I think we can begin more intelligently to address uh, the problem. But it's a problem. You suffered a traumatic injury while you were in college. How did that affect the course of your life, the decisions that you made in your life? Well, I broke my back when I was 18, and I was paralyzed, and I had a difficult time uh, at that age uh, learning to walk again. Uh, you know, one doesn't want to make more of that than is appropriate. Uh, I had a bad accident. It happens to a lot of people, and uh, one does what one has to do. Um, it had an effect on me. I was an athlete, and enjoyed playing sports and that ended and I I got very much interested in academic things and in, in the life of the mind and that's also very important to me um, so it had a big effect on my life but it was not something that uh, other people don't also uh, encounter and deal with why did you and Bart become such good friends what was it that drew the two of you together he was a boy from South Hadley I was from Waterbury, we loved New Haven, we had Yale in common, and um, we found that both as, as intellects, as people interested in books and uh, in sports and in you know, the life in general, we had an awful lot to share, and, and that continued to bring us closer and closer. I know that at one point in your life you wanted to be a priest, and I, I would imagine you've taken some quiet time to think about why 
all these events have transpired around you the way they have. What, what are some of the thoughts that you have about that? Well, uh, you're approaching personal issues. I mean, for me, I have a view about life, and uh, I, I don't know that uh, it's a view that, uh, that uh, many or most uh, would share, but I have a faith, and for me, uh, we're not supposed to know uh, the answers, and we don't believe that this is the full, uh, the full story. Um, so I, I believe Bart uh, uh, came to a tragic early end, but for me, uh, uh, given my own faith, um, I believe Bart uh, is aware of what's going on and uh, and that um, there is something ahead for us. And, uh, and for me, that's a great consolation. As Bart Giamatti brought Faye Vincent into baseball as his deputy commissioner, so Faye Vincent plans to hire his own deputy as soon as possible. He says he does have a couple of people in mind, but will not say who they are right now. And Faye Vincent takes the reins at a time that is always difficult. The players and owners will try to hash out a new collective bargaining agreement once the World Series is over. We will take a break and be back to wrap things up right after this. Stay with us. Now, Cleveland leading Toronto that game in the third inning, 2-1 to one is the score. We'd also like to remind you that coming up after baseball, the conclusion of the World Cup track and field championships from Barcelona, Right now, the Cubs and the Pirates with Vince Scully and Tom Seaver calling the action, or the A's and Red Sox with Bob Costas and Tony Kubek. We will have updates for you throughout the afternoon. Thanks for being with us, and enjoy the action. It's buzzing with excitement as the Red Sox barrel toward the title in the American League East under the guiding hand of first-year manager Joe Morgan. This time around, no such luck for fans in the hub. The Sox are out of it, and they're playing out the string for 89. The race, meanwhile, is watched with interest by the Audubon Society, the top two perches occupied by the Blue Jays and the Orioles. Over in the West, the A's, the defending champs who swept the playoffs against the Red Sox a year ago, look to reprise that championship, but they're being chased by Kansas City and California, the Royals and Angels very much alive, each three and a half behind. As we look at the games remaining, you know the Orioles are pointing toward the head-to-head -head matchup to conclude the season, three games in the Sky Dome, final weekend of the year. And although Kansas City and California have the same deficit in the West, the Royals' chances look brighter because they finished the season with three at Oakland. For now, the A's try and maintain their lead, going head-to-head -head against the Red Sox here at Fenway on the Game of the Week. National Broadcasting Company, now in its seventh decade of bringing you baseball memories. Baseball's Milestones. Baseball's Magical Moments. Baseball's Miracles. NBC Sports proudly presents the Major League Baseball Game of the Week. September day at Fenway Park as the Red Sox play out the string on this imperfect 1989 season. Hi, everybody. Bob Costas along with Tony Kubek. A small consolation for the Red Sox. They did halt their eight-game losing streak here last night. Roger Clemens picked up his 15th victory. They beat the A's 7-2. But Tony LaRusso's team wasn't hurt too badly because Kansas City lost to Baltimore and California could only manage a split of their doubleheader with the White Sox. And so the A's lead both by three and a half in the West. LaRusso will go with Storm Davis today. He's 17 and 6. Joe Morgan's choice for the Red Sox right-hander John Dobson. He's 10 and 7. Earlier, Dave Parker visited with Tony Kubek down on the field. All right, thank you, Bob. Dave, there's some people around the Oakland, San Francisco Bay Area say you may be the MVP of this ball club when a lot of guys are going down and hurt and Conseco was out and McGuire wasn't swinging the bat. You were carrying the ball club. What do you feel about that? Well, I was just glad that, uh, that I was able to contribute at, at that time. You know, when you lose a guy like... Uh, and say go and McGuire and, and you lose them all at the same time you know it, it puts a strain on the ball club I'm just 
glad that I was swinging good at that time and was able to contribute like I did. From a man who's been through as many pennant races as anybody else in this ball club, what do you foresee the rest of the way for the Oakland A's? I think right now we, we have a stage, what I call the sprint stage, where we just, uh, with three games out in front, and, and we don't look back. Uh, we just go and try to click off as many wins as we can, and uh, I'm very confident that we'll do so because we've got a good, positive approach to playing every day, and let's go out and, and give them a hard 27 outs and a tough nine innings, and that's done work for us this year, along with it working for us last year. So I think we're in good shape, and it's just a matter of playing good the rest of the way. Because so many people were hurt early in the season, Troy and Conseco, for such a lengthy uh, period of time, a lot of the other players were pushed hard. And physically, there are going to be a lot of little injuries. You're usually tired at this time of the year. But is the emotional state of this ball club, after all the duress all year, in good shape? I think so. Uh, along with that, I think guys realize what we're playing for and what's at stake here. And they're going to play with little nagging injuries. Uh, I don't think that uh, you find too many guys with, with a slightly poor muscle uh, staying on the lineup. Uh, you know, right now, we, we're ready to go back and, and try to get back to the World Series because we fell short a little bit last year. And we achieved everything we wanted to last year except for winning the series. So we want to get back there and try to redeem ourselves. Do you have a special message you want to pass somebody? Yes, I'd like to uh, tell my son, uh, D2, who's Dave Dean Parker II, that happy birthday. His birthday was Friday, and I miss you, son. Thank you, Dave. We'll be back to Fenway Park with a starting lineup right after this. Game of the Week is brought to you by the new generation of Oldsmobile. Step into the future now at your Oldsmobile dealer. By Franklin, the batting glove that's a hit with the best in baseball. By Crest, the dentist's choice for fighting cavities. Crest with Fluorostat. And by Die Hard, America's most trusted replacement battery. Die Hard, with more power when you need it most. And now, here's today's Die Hard starting lineup. A year ago, the A's felt they were the best team in baseball. They make no excuses about their World Series defeat at the hands of the Dodgers. They say we were the best team, but they played better that week. But obviously, their incentive is to get back there. In order to equal last year's 104 victories for the regular season, though, they'd have to sweep their last 16. They're 88 and 58 and three and a half up in the American League West. But considering the extended absences of Canseco, McGuire for a while earlier in the year, Eckersley, their bullpen stopper, Walt Weiss for a couple of months. Tony La Russa has done an excellent job keeping them in first place, and though he probably won't get Manager of the Year honors, Tony, he might very well deserve it. He's going to get some votes, but it'll probably go to Frank Robinson with a few scattered votes for Cito Gast and the Blue Jays. Well, you can't argue with Robbie either. Oh, no, you can't. Getting Ricky Henderson didn't hurt him and getting Conseco back. John Dobson, well, he spent a lot of time in the bullpen with Billy Fisher, the pitching coach, working from the stretch. He has committed 15 balks this season, and he's one shy of the Major League record. Dave Stewart has that. He made only one ball, committed only one ball last year in the National League. He's got 15 already this year. Let's take a look at the defense behind them. Over their last 36 games, the Red Sox have averaged upwards of an error a game. They've been shaky. Kevin Romine starting today. Ellis Burks out again with another shoulder injury. Kutcher left the ball game yesterday, re-injured a groin. Boggs, for a while, they didn't think he was going to start today. Hit very hard on the right elbow. And this happened last night when Kurt Young came in. Lansford had been hit earlier in the ball game. I mean, there's no way right on the right elbow. It'll be interesting to see, Bob, whether or not some of these speedier A's down in the lineup will try and bunt on him because he had trouble throwing earlier this morning. Wade Boggs in the batting race. Lansford and Puckett. Boggs was officially 0 for 2 last night before being removed after being hit on the elbow in the sixth inning. Lansford went 0 for 3. Lansford is tied with Puckett at 336. Boggs trying to win for the sixth time in seven years is hitting 331. In addition to those numbers, Henderson is far and away the league leader with 65 steals. Strike one, says Greg Kosk, the plate umpire. John Hirschbeck at first. Larry Barnett at second. Dale Ford at third. And it's typical of Ricky Henderson's game. He says he plays it with a flair. First pitch, he gets out of the box, gets out of the deep crouch, and has a little silent discussion with the home plate umpire. Didn't like the call. Breezy day. Temperatures in the 60s. Tries to drop a bunt, and it rolls foul. Every one of these Oakland A's players out for batting practice, and they were out early at 10 this morning after night game, some of them hitting, a lot of the extra players, but they 
saw Boggs trying to get the right elbow loose. Of course, Ricky has been in a little bit of a slump over the last week and a half or so. Anderson, as you see, in a bit of a September swoon. Outside, a ball and two strikes. Kansas City is at Baltimore. Gubaza, who's 115, will pitch against Jeff Ballard, who's 17 and 7. That's an afternoon game. As Gail Gardner told you, Cleveland behind John Farrell has an early 2-1 lead on Dave Steve and the Blue Jays at the Sky Dome. 1-2 pitch. Swings at a pitch in the dirt and fouls it off. And the other game involving a contender in the American League, California at Chicago. Kirk McCaskill at 15 and 8 against Sean Hillegas, the former Dodger, who's 6 and 10. So we'll keep an eye on the scoreboard for you with the Jays leading the Orioles by a game and a half and Oakland three and a half in front of both Kansas City and California. Into center field, a leadoff hit. And now two things to watch. Henderson because you always watch Ricky and Dobson to see if he's baited into a record tying 16 box and to put it in perspective last year the year of the balk Dave Stewart of these A's set the dubious record with 16 but he pitched 276 innings Dobson has 15 already in 145 innings Ricky Henderson has stolen 40 bases with the Oakland Athletics been caught just four times and the perfect man hitting behind him. Great bat control, a fastball hitter, will take a lot of pitches. Henderson with a modest lead and the pitch inside to Lansford who of course won the batting title in the strike interrupted 1981 season when he was Bob's predecessor at third base for these Red Sox. Up high, 2-0. and oh. Lansford, with the 336 mark in 81, is the last right-handed batter to lead the American League in hitting. If he doesn't do it this year, Puckett might become the first right-handed hitter since 81 to do it. Hit toward Boggs. Foul ball. Foul made by the third base umpire, Dale Ford. It's maybe too early to tell with two balls and just that one last swinging strike to Lansford, but with a man on base from the stretch, you may already see that Dobson's rhythm is a little bit upset, trying to hold the ball, hold the ball, and then his velocity through the plater's control might be affected. Very conscious of not committing a balk. Dobson is 26 years old, 6'4", 205, a native of Baltimore, 3 and 11 a year ago, but with a decent ERA for Montreal. He came over in the Spike Owen transaction. He's got a terrific sinker, Bob, and a slider, and he can get the ground ball very quickly if he's down in the strike zone. What Carney Lansford would like to do, whether or not Ricky Anderson's running, if he's hitting, he'd like to shoot the ball through the right side. But off the hard stinker ball pitcher, that's awfully difficult to do. He's gone. There he goes. Pitch taken inside. High throw, and Henderson's in there easily. 66th of the year. 41 since the trade with the Yankees. You know, the thing about Ricky, he never tips off whether he's going or not. I don't know if that matters or not, but he takes as much of a beeline from his first step as anybody. Some players waver along the way and take that extra step but he's heading right for the bag. And don't take him lightly. He stole third base about 18 times this season. And he was going to go, and Jody Reed's holding him back. This will be a 3-1 pitch, and time is called. You saw Lansford's numbers post-All-Star game this year when he sizzled, and in 88 when he fizzled. Last year, on June 4th, he was hitting 402, but partly due to an injured wrist, he finished the year at 279. He's there he goes ahead. to third, but he fouls it off and the count is full. And he had that base stolen by three or four steps. Well, the sinker ball down and in that looked a little too good to Carney Lansford. And I'm sure that's the first thing Henderson told Lansford when he came over. Look, if I'm going, do I bother you? And Lansford, I'm sure, said, no, my concentration will not waver. 
And Ricky all so I'm sure he said, if you want to go after it, I don't care whether I got a good jump or not. And Lansford had the three and one pitch. And he thought it was pretty good to hit at. The batting race, of course, is subplot in this game. And we'll track Boggs and Lansford for you with each at bat. Puckett doesn't play until tonight. The payoff hit off Dobson. He chases after it. No throw, and it's a base hit for Lansford, who's now hitting 337. Henderson holds second. At one time, Lansford, one of the fastest runners from the right side in the American League down to first base. And he has slowed down a little bit, but he's got 30 stolen bases this year, and he still is very quick. Poor follow through back to home plate. So he cost himself an out. So at this instant, as he talks with Coach Dave McKay, Lansford has a one-point lead on Puckett, who faced the Tigers' Doyle Alexander at the Metrodome tonight. Canseco took Clemens into the screen for a first-inning homer last night, but Roger regrouped in 1-7-2. Swing and a miss. How dominant is this guy, Conseco? He's got 45 base hits. For all the injuries, 44 runs batted in with those hits and 15 home runs. He not even started stealing bases yet. He only has four of those, but a third of his hits have gone over the fence. There go both runners. Here's the throw from Cerrone. Henderson safe, and Lansford moves up behind him. And Rick Cerrone had a throw over the top of the six-foot-three-inch Jose Conseco. And by standing straight up, not being able to go right at third base, it allowed Ricky an extra step. And you can see right over the top of the bat. And the throw, because of that, rides up high. He couldn't get it down. Boy, they've got a lot of weapons to throw at you, don't you? Aside from that great, great pitching staff that leads the league in ERA behind Dave Duncan. They run. They've got power. A lot of ways to beat you. A ball and a strike to Jose. Infield concedes the run. Dobson gets ahead, one and two. Canseco walking away. The scoreboard was wrong on the count, and I apologize for not picking it up. A key strikeout for Dobson. He went with a riding fastball instead of the fastball down low. Canseco, a slugger. Yeah, it was a sinking fastball. So now it'll be Parker, who about six weeks into the year was hitting 180. So figure that in as you look at the 267. He hasn't surrendered the time just yet. And last year, that was not a strong spot for the Oakland Athletics team. Their DHs were not doing what Dave Parker is this year for. Him. Remember, he played in the outfield a little bit. Oh, this ball off his foot, or did the knee go? He's had knee problems off and on during his career. You would like, Bob, with a pitcher like Dobson, the infield back, you want the fly ball, but when he's got the sinker ball down, as he did just then to Parker, and the Conseco to strike him out, it's hard to get the ball in the air, even if you're a low ball hitter. I believe if he can get his 30 plus start capable of winning 15 ball games or more. His arm is that good. 10 and 7 this year. His ERA just a fraction beneath four. Parker stays alive. When we came on the air, the sun was shining brightly. But there is the possibility of rain in the forecast and some clouds have moved in. Stiff breeze straightening the flag out in center field, a flag that flies at half mast as it will in ballparks around the country for the rest of the year in honor of the late Bart Giamatti. Gets a piece of it again. The World Series this year will be dedicated to the 
late commissioner. And this, of course, was his favorite baseball stomping grounds, home of his beloved Red Sox, Fenway Park. As you walk around the campus, it's going from class to class, the transistor listening to the Sox game. And wearing a Bo Sox cap. <laughs> this will make the seats down the left side. You can see why Dave Parker has stayed successful, even as he's progressed along in years. Tough pitcher, choked up on the bat a little bit. He has cut down his swing to just put the ball in play. Another one to Big Dave. Hit towards second base. They're going to get the out on a nice play by Reed as he makes the backhanded grab and whirling throw to Asaski. But Henderson comes across, and Lansford moves up to third. one nothing open. Reed's play almost wasn't so nice. With Parker running after he just showed that he had a bad knee and a bad foot following a ball off, as Reed could have planted and not made such an off-balance throw. The ball bounced, and Sasky makes the good play on this. Reed had plenty of time to set up and get something on the ball with Parker running with a hurt foot. Nice play, Sasky. Dave Henderson, a part of baseball lore in this city for his exploits in 86, now wearing an Oakland uniform. You know, the interesting thing, we've talked about the box already on Dobson, one shy of the record, and you wonder with two outs and a man on third, why he would pitch from the stretch and tempt fate. And what he's doing, he's coming to a lot, lot longer stop. But I guess he feels comfortable this way. His 0-1 pitch. Breaking ball, top down toward Boggs. Throws on the run and gets it. So they had second and third with nobody out, all things considered. The damage was minimized, only 1-0. Storm Davis at 17-6 has benefited from excellent offensive support and the strong bullpen of the Oakland A's. This is his 28th start, and yet he's worked only 146 innings. He's thrown only one complete game, and his ERA is four and a half. But the overall record, 17 and six. Over his last 10 starts, he's been as good as any A's starter. Remember, the A's have four in the top seven in wins in the American League. See if Bob's swing is affected at all by the aching elbow. A ball and a strike. Points are hard to come by on the batting average. You know, you can go three for three and only pick up three or four points. And now he's six back of Lansford in the race. 337 to 331. One and two. He's not only playing with a bad right elbow, he's got a bad knee, he isn't running very well, and that could very well hurt his chance at the batting title because he can't beat out those base hits. I'll tell you something. Something strange is happening at Fenway Park. First, I didn't know the count on the top of the inning to Conseco. Now, Hassey didn't know the count to Boggs. He threw the ball around. He, he threw the ball around the horn thinking <laughs> they had him struck out. <laughs> Here's the one, too. Now I'm not so embarrassed. Wade Boggs needs 13 base hits for 200, three walks for 100. If he gets them, it'll be the fifth consecutive time he's done that. It's never been done in major leagues before. Dale Ford. He just shook his head, but Boggs did not go too far. The 2-2 two -two pitch. He does a couple things with a fastball. He's got a good curve. And he's throwing a fork ball. His last time out, Davis beat the Yankees at Oakland. Allowed six hits and two runs in six innings of work. Then the bullpen finished for him. Stays at three and two. And you can see that pitching coach Dave Duncan has Storm Davis working a little more quickly. Not 
taking much time, not thinking a lot, getting the ball, using his fastball more effectively. And Boggs just continues to wait for the pitch he wants, the one he can drive. This is kind of the bat, isn't it? How many times have you seen him do this over the years? The thing is, when he fouls off the good pitches, he never puts them in play. He fouls them out of the ballpark. And he draws the walk. Because he's been hitting 385 in this ballpark this year, and there's very little foul territory. Yeah, that's one of the things you look at. Uh, Lansford, that big Oakland Coliseum, dirt and grass, no short fence, a lot of foul territory, and still he's sitting near the top of the league, at the top of the league in his batting average. Marty Barrett is not in the lineup today. Jody Reed hitting second at second base. Ball for a strike. A year ago, Storm Davis won 16 for the American League pennant winners. He had some good seasons in Baltimore in his early 20s, 13 and 7, as they won the world title in 83, and he won 14 games the next year. This fastball is high. Boston has beaten Oakland three times. And Oakland's won just one of this ballpark. Al Bumbley with a few words of instruction for Boggs. It's not going to be an easy road trip for the Oakland A's. They're going to clean with that good pitching, and then Minnesota. The Twins are playing really well. Left center field, the two Hendersons. It's Dave. One of the reasons Boggs had to stay in the lineup at third base is that Evans can't play defensively. His back has bothered him off and on for months. DH for over 50 games now. Bill Boggs in the lineup, and he would like to DH, I would assume. He can't because of Evans. Evans narrowly missed his 19th homer last night. A disputed call on a drive to the bleachers in dead center. Evans thought it was out, but a fan apparently reached out and touched it. Slapped into center field, and Dave Henderson will tuck this one away as well. The fan reached out and touched it just a few inches beneath the top of the wall and they ruled it a double. Mm -hmm. That last pitch that Evans hit the center field was that little cut fastball called a slider years ago that ironically Renee Latchman taught Storm Davis. It's an interesting story. He got bombed up in Seattle at the end of July, and then he was scheduled to go with Latchman for a clinic. And Latchman was teaching the kids the different finger positions on the baseball and showed the kids how to cut a fastball. One in the left hand. Davis has been effective since his Detroit. Slow roller, which Lansford picks up and gets the out on the throw across to McGuire. No runs, no hits, a walk, and Boggs is stranded. one nothing A's. Who face Hassey, McGuire, and Phillips in the second. Oakland up 1 0. <laughs> Swings at one down low. 0 oh 1 the count. The Dobson has enjoyed pitching on the road a bit better than at home as we look at Hassey's numbers. On the road, Dobson is 6 and 3 and a good ERA, 3.19. Here he's just broken even, 4 and 4, ERA 4.5. Four The two catchers, Terry Steinbach and Ron Hassey, have not been in a strict platoon situation for Tony LaRusso and Dave Duncan, I should mention. What they are doing is the catcher that seems to handle or feel most comfortable with the pitcher is the one who's usually going to catch. And yesterday, Steinbach caught against Roger Clemens last night. And they're looking more at the guys that work best together, pitchers and catchers, rather than how much he's going to hit against a certain pitcher. That comes first. And then if you get the hitting aside from that, more of a plus. That is the strength of this team, their pitching staff. Dobson falls behind three and one. There's Duncan. Uh, I mean, I really believe that Dave Duncan could be a manager somewhere. There are rumors that Toronto might have been interested, but because he is so valuable in a long-term contract with Oakland. Lead-off walk for Hassan. Well, LaRusso told me that he's noticed that Duncan, who has enough responsibilities, 
handling the pitchers has taken an even greater interest in other meetings that go beyond the pitchers. He's starting to eavesdrop a bit more, ask questions beyond his area of responsibility, indicating that Duncan, who's not pushing for it, would have, in the normal course of things, an interest in managing someday. Well, Jimmy Leland's mentor was Tony La Russa. McGuire's average not very impressive, but 82 runs battled in is hard to come by. Outside chance to get 100. Hits it toward the hole. A diving stop by Rivera. They get the force on the throw to Reed. A dandy play. One of those plays of dandy, and I'm not going to be overly critical, critical of Rivera, but I really believe with a pole hitter like McGuire and a sinker ball pitcher, you've got to be playing him in the hole. He's pitching him inside, pitch he's more likely to pull, and this is brilliant. And I think that might have been the ball could have been turned if he's starting off in the proper position. He was cheating a little bit too much to second base. So middle infielders have a tendency to do too often. Switch hitter Tony Phillips. Three for three last night and six hits in his last six official at bats. Yeah. Oh, and two. You know, there are some people that feel that Rivera at short and Reed at second is better than Reed at short and Barrett at second. And they played very well together when Barrett was on the DL with uh, the knee injury. In the air to left, back goes Greenwell near the scoreboard. And it's off the scoreboard, over his head. And yet it winds up being only a single as McGuire had to hold to see if it would be caught. And just as importantly, Romine made a very good play coming over from center field to get the carom after it bounced back over Greenwell. McGuire made a mistake. He's got only one thing that he should be doing in this, and that is being standing almost on top of second base, and as soon as the ball is not caught, he's got one base to go from second to third. He was about halfway between second and first and starting to go back toward first. He committed himself back to first base too soon. It sure really should have been a first and third. Even if the ball is caught, as you say, Tony, he oh, could sure. be a He's step on the other side of second base and still get back. Good play by Kevin Romine back in that playoff coming from center field. Gallego. Trouble. He's a high Trouble. chopper. Trouble. Boggs' only chance is at first. He gets rid of it quickly. And they get Gallego there. 24. So runners at second and third with two out. And you said it, he had to get rid of it quickly because of the elbow after the ball bounded off home plate. Cleveland continues to lead at the Sky Dome. Dave Clark has a homer in that one. His eighth of the year, Tony Fernandez got one to account for the Toronto run, his tenth. Henderson singled and stole two bases in the first, bringing his total to 67. He scored the game's only run. And a strike on the inside corner. McGuire at third. Phillips, who singled off the green monster, now at second. This time Dobson is second and third, elects to go from the windup. The situation, the older runner close at second, so he might not score on a base set. Flip flopping from what I thought he should have done in the last inning. Of course, Henderson was the lead runner at third base in the last inning, and he might have been concerned with the possibility of him breaking for the plate. In this case, you got McGuire. Well, you're not worried about McGuire. He's going to score on a base set. You're worrying about the guy in second base. So you'd like to cut his lead down in just a little bit so your outfitters might have a play on it. And away one and two. Not too many teams have players that are as dominant in so many ways as the Oakland A's. Now that Conseco's healthy, along with Henderson, speed, 
home run power. The Red Sox were victimized by a steal of home on the last road trip. It was the back end of a spectacular feat by Devon White. Second, third, and stole home. second, third, and home in the same inning. And we're not talking about double steals, legitimate steals. Two and two. For those who had heard the rest of the story, people in Boston have Joe Price was the pitcher. He and Joe Morgan went at it in the dugout. Come on, Johnny. Joe Morgan won that one. Lou Gorman, the GM, suspended and fined. Joe Price, four-day suspension. It's going to be filed, I guess, a grievance to the Players Association. Rivera charging. Belt high hop. He throws Henderson out. And the A's lead two. McGuire's base running mistake cost them in this inning. We missed a pitch on the leadoff man, Nick Asaski. He swung and missed. Owen won the count as he settles back in with his 26 homers and 98 RBIs. And a breaking ball is hit in the air to right. Canseco started in, now goes back and puts it away. It's a funny kind of wind, Bob. Usually at this time of year, the wind's blowing in from left field. And the flag in center sometimes shows like it's blowing in from left field. And yet that ball that Phillips had kept on carrying and fooled Greenwell earlier. Kind of tangled around the mass now in center field. But even that one seemed to have more carry than Canseco thought. Look at him shake his head and look back toward the flag to try and get a gauge on how the wind is blowing. But like you say, Tony, it's changing from moment to moment. A strike to Heap, who's quietly had a very good year since he started to accumulate the at-bats. Burks got hurt. Greenwell spent a stretch on the DL. Evans often was only able to DH. And that gave Heap the turns at bat he needed to reestablish himself as a quality big league hitter. One and two. Well, like most left-handers who come to Fenway Park, he's found it a great place to hit. Thanks to Pete Runnels, Billy Klaus, we don't need to say anything about Yastrzemski and Williams and Boggs. Boy, this is a nice park for left-handers. Because of that wall, you can figure out a pitching pattern. They want to keep the ball in on you so you don't hit the ball the opposite way, and they want to change speeds and make you pull the ball to a big part of the ballpark, and it's easy to find a pitching pattern if you're a hitter here. Plus, you see a lot of right-handed pitchers, too. That's a big one. Rolled softly to short. Gallego charging. And he cuts Heap down at first. Boy, you, we talked about Parker earlier, perhaps being MVP material for this team. Nobody thought that Gallego would be playing his 119th game. But when Weiss went down with a knee problem, this guy's little acrobat. He's hit about 260 all year. Terrifically agile middle infielder. Weiss missed more than two months, and although he's back, he's not 100%. And while he's still fine with the glove, he's not quite the defensive player he was during his Rookie of the Year season in 1988. Tony La Russa puts a percentage. He's about 85% right. The ball to right still bothers him a little bit, talking about Weiss. Swing and a miss by Rivera, who's just two for his last 28. Hitting 261 overall. In fact, Weiss made an error last night on a ball hit to his right. With that knee, he just can't seem to get down on the ball while he's moving. Gallego has been a more than capable fill-in. Breaking ball outside. One and two. Two out, nobody out on the second. The eight ball. lead, one nothing. Here's Walt out of North Carolina. B.J. Surhoff was a shortstop there. B.J., Walt Weiss is here. You're going to have to become a catcher. Weiss is the guy in the warm-up jacket. Lays off, full count. With a piece of gum just being set on top of his little hat. Bird seed. <laughs> <laughs> Fastball high. Rivera draws a walk. It's an interesting theory. Well, you know, he finally found it. We 
wish you a happy marriage also. Paul and Janet. I wonder if the nuptials were right here at Fenway. Spending their honeymoon here? Well, if you have those season tickets, you don't want to waste what you paid. So maybe you've got to come to the game until the homestand is over and then head for your honeymoon spot. For a park that seats barely over 30,000, uh, over 2 million again this year. Romine at 272. In fact, the Red Sox have a good chance to break their attendance record. In 88, they drew just under 2,500,000. This year, they're averaging 31,600 a game in this tiny park. And since most of the seats are sold in advance, their place in the standings really isn't going to hurt their attendance that much. Throw by Hassey to McGuire, but Rivera gets back. And so, even though their season has been disappointing, to put it mildly, they'll probably set a team attendance record. Vincent Van Gogh on him. Almost singed his ear, but he made the play back after this from your local station. The Game of the Week is brought to you by today's Chevrolet, who invites you to see why nobody's winning like the heartbeat of America. And by Adidas Aftershave and Cologne, the essence of sports. On to the third with Dobson and the Red Sox, trailing the A's, 1-0. Lansford, Conseco, and Parker here. Carney hit one sharply off Dobson's leg, beat it out for an infield hit in the first. Later stole his 32nd base. Rolled toward Boggs, fair ball, and he's gone. Now, even though he was out on that play, he's still hitting 337. He had picked up a point from 336 to 337 with his hit in the first, and the way the numbers are rounded off, he's still at 337 after being thrown out 5-3. And you know, the way Boggs has played third base this year, he's going to get some votes for a gold glove. Gary Gaetti, of course, it seemed to have had a lock on that. But Gary coming off the knee surgery, he's missed some games with some back problems. Boy, he's had a good sinker ball today, and that's one of the reasons why a couple of opportunities. First inning, Oakland A's have first and second. Nobody out come up with one. They have first and second, just one out, but he's made them beat that ball on the ground. Keeps the ball down like that, you're gonna have to string three base hits together. Usually singles to start pounding on a much. And Seiko grounds it foul. Jose missed the first 89 games, of course, with that fractured left wrist. Didn't play in the All-Star game, although the fans voted him a starter. Returned with a bang. In his first game on July 13th, he went two for three with a homer and three RBIs. And he's hit 15 to this point in his abbreviated season. Last year, of course, the unanimous MVP with the 42 home runs, 124 RBIs. When he's healthy, he's still the best all-around player in the American League. Good throwing arm. Bobs can't handle it. We'll wait for the scoring, but it's a play he should have made despite the tricky hop. It's not unusual to see hops like that off the bat of somebody as strong as Conseco because of that tremendous top spin. He accelerates the bat through the ball so hard that he doesn't lose any bat speed through the ball and that top spin hits the dirt and it bounds up. See guys like Moose Scourn and Mickey Mantle, Harmon Killebrew, Frank Howard at balls like that. Freddie McGriff, George Bell. They scored a hit. Parker the batter. Canseco, who established the 40-40 club a year ago. Howard Johnson of the Mets has an outside chance to become the second member in history this year. He has a hot final two weeks. Canseco at first, he's stolen only four this year. Fouled out of play. Remember last year, before the season started, Conseco went on an extended program for his legs to make him quicker, and it worked in his 40 stolen base year. This year, I would think, spending so much time on the wrist after the surgery, he probably couldn't concentrate much in the lower body. He's been in a lot of trouble since 
last season, hasn't he? The police chief in <laughs> Pleasanton, California, which is near Oakland, sent an open letter to the newspapers, an open letter to Jose Canseco. Hey, you're immature. Straighten up. You're setting a bad example. Here it is on one and one. Could be two. The tag, the throw, double play. On to the bottom of the third. Still one nothing A's. Storm Davis's former team, the Baltimore Orioles, had four 20 game winners in 1971. Cuellar, Palmer, Dobson and McNally. The A's have an outside chance to duplicate that feat this year. Dave Stewart has 19 in pursuit of his third straight 20 victory season. Storm Davis and Mike Moore each with 17. Bob Welch, who pitches here tomorrow, has 16 and would need to win all his remaining starts to get to 20. Moore had a chance for his 18th win here last night, but Roger Clemens beat him. Rick Cerrone hits it slowly toward the middle. Gallego to his left has time. He does it with that first quick step, not with blazing speed, whether he's at second or at short. There's the fork ball, and it completely fools Cerrone. He's always on balance. As opposed to the unbalanced Bob Costa sitting to my left. <laughs> Trying to save yourself with a <laughs> bogus and gratuitous insult. <laughs> Meanwhile, McGuire makes the play unassisted on Boggs. You know, you're talking about the possibility of four 20-game winners with this staff, the A's. It's going to be tough, but they may have improved a little bit. Uh, Kurt Young was going to start, the left-hander, on Tuesday. But with Mike Moore having a short outing yesterday, they're going to skip Kurt Young, and Moore's going to come back. He did it back in the four-man rotation. Boggs is now 0 for 1, plus a walk, and he's lost a point to 3.30. Outside to Jody Reed. You mentioned that some people think Reed and Rivera in the middle of the diamond would be a better combination than Reed at short and Barrett at second, and that's no slight intended toward Barrett, who has been one of the quality players in the American League for the past half decade. But the Red Sox do have to consider some off-season moves. And you have to give quality to get quality. It's obvious they lack depth in their starting rotation. They might lose Nick Osaski to free agency and get nothing in return. There's to Atlanta, talk of him going to Atlanta. He lives near the ballpark there. Joe Morgan says his team is two good pitchers away from being a contender. Shallow fly, left center, Ricky Henderson. Puts a quick end to the bottom of the third, so Barrett is one of those people they'd have to consider trading. Not to get rid of him, but to bring something back. And we'll be back. On the back of the bleacher wall in right center field, but that's mild compared to some of the things Morgan has heard Bob in the papers, on the talk shows, and from his own players this year. Bob Stanley put that sign up. No, he didn't. I wonder if you could put a banner like that up in Yankee Stadium. Well, you know, they had banner night uh, there last night, and... Uh, the edict from George Steinbrenner was they can say anything they want about me as long as it doesn't include profanity. So if they want to rip me on banner night, we won't confiscate any of their bed sheets. That was just a one-day change in policy, though, I believe. Henderson grounded out his first time. Here's one of the guys, Bob, Dave Henderson, who I think... When everybody else was getting hurt, he was playing through injuries. Uh, aching legs and sore shoulders, and I think it's hurt his average, but he just signed a big contract and he just kept going out there. Toward the gap, a diving try by Romine, but he doesn't come up with it. Henderson has at least a double as Greenwell backs up. And he stops his second to open the fourth inning. Looked like that ball bounded up and may have hit him on the side of the face on that dive. Don't know if Alice Burks or Kutcher would have gotten it. This is one heck of a try, but you lose so much when Alice Burks is not in your lineup. His speed, his defense, his throwing arm, his power. 
Larusa was telling me that although the combination of injuries has reduced the numbers offensively for Henderson, it's increased his stature in that clubhouse. Oh, he yeah. said when Dave Henderson strides through the clubhouse, especially the younger players, look at him, mindful of what he's gone through, <laughs> keep playing. As he drops a bond, oh. and it's just foul, just before the bag. It went foul. That's a very interesting play. A left-handed hitter who's a pull header with a chance to drive the man in from second base. And you've got McGuire, who's not hitting for average, and then Phillips and Gallego. Why in the heck would you want to bunt and give him out up so easily? Let's take a whack and try and hit the ball to the right side. You might get a base hit if you get a ground ball or a fly ball deep to right. He's going to be on third base. I'm sure that was a call player if he did it on his own. I guarantee you, Hassey hasn't beaten out many bunts in his career. Mm -mm. He had a walk in the second inning. A's lead 1-0 as they bat here in the fourth. They have five hits. Red Sox have none. Tony La Russa is established enough as a big league manager, and he has enough of a blend of talents around him that he's begun to think of fine-tuning. Not just ability on the field, but the overall feeling in the clubhouse. Not just one year, but a series of years. What kind of combination of talents and personalities he can put together on a ball club. Continue after this pitch. Which is hit back to Dobson. He'll hold the runner, looking over at Henderson and throwing Hassey out. For example, LaRusa thinks a guy like Ricky Henderson is affected positively by the diffusion of pressure. That's LaRusse's phrase. Henderson doesn't have to be the biggest star. You look around this clubhouse, there are so many all-star performers that Henderson can kind of blend in. Plus, he respects so many of the people in that clubhouse. Dave Parker, Dave Stewart, guys who have gotten close to him, that if he lets down, as Henderson has been known to do in the past, one look or one word from those guys will snap him back into line. There's something added to the area. There goes the right field. And Cerrone can't even get it out of his glove. Well, he just figured he isn't going to throw because by the time the ball hit his glove and his arm was cocked, Henderson, and this is an exaggeration, but pretty close, was almost going to his slide. And again, this is why Dobson has had trouble holding men on. And then he has to hold the ball because he can call for so many box. And Tony La Russa and Dave Duncan know this. Dave Duncan will help him with a series of pitches at times. There wasn't much of a chance for Sarone, so he ate it. Infield's in now. So Henderson picks up Hassey, who didn't do his job grounding back to the pitcher with that steal. Well, you got to add in one other thing about Ricky Henderson. Cleveland 2, Toronto 1 in the sixth. Carter with a home run. 3-3, three, three, Chicago, Pittsburgh. It's Maddox against Smiley there. You got to add about Ricky Henderson. He's in his last year of his contract, and he can be a free agent. Will he stay in Oakland, his home, or will he go back to the Yankees? Or elsewhere. The 0-2 pitch. Fouled off. And so a big part of it for La Russa, Not just the offensive contributions of people like Parker and Henderson. Dave Henderson I'm speaking about. But their presence in that clubhouse and the influence on the younger players. the air to relatively shallow right. Heap is coming in. Doesn't have a great arm. Dave Henderson tags. Here's the throw. And Hendu goes back. And that win just kept drifting the ball closer and closer to the infield. McGuire's left shoulder flew open. Didn't really have enough thrust behind the bat to power the ball deeply enough. And Heap set up very nicely to get the throw off quickly. Are they going to miss another opportunity to the Oakland A's? He's got to come in in case Phillips tries to drop a bunt down. And Sasky's got to be careful also. Even with two outs. Oh, man. Henderson. Henderson way down the line. He was trying to create a balk. He was halfway down. In fact, Rick Cerrone was just about coming out in front of home plate. Watch Dave Henderson going from the windup. 
Now watch what Sarone does if we can pick it up. Well, the replay stopped. But Sarone motioned to Dobson as he held the ball out in front of the plate. Made a movement toward his belt. Like, go to remember the to come set. Well, he's telling him to go to the stretch now. He's out of the line the first time. 2-0. Oh. Well, it's no question it's, it's been playing in Dobson's mind. It's got to when you've balked 15 times. And the Athletics have had their opportunities, haven't been able to capitalize to this point. But he's had a terrific sinker ball. He's got nine ground ball outs already, Dobson. Phillips has hits in his last seven times at bat. 3-0, and oh, but he might very well be taking a rip here with a right-handed batter, Gallego, waiting next. The A's have left three, plus hit into a double play. They lead one nothing. Hit sharply. You call it. Reads up with it, throws him out. So he hit it hard on the 3-0 pitch, but couldn't get the run home, and the A's are one for nine with men in scoring position so far. Ball one to Dwight Evans as we start the bottom half of the fourth. Storm Davis having to make do with a one-nothing lead, although the A's have had chances to increase it. 2-0. Right down the middle. Davis hasn't allowed a hit. He's walked two. We're just in the fourth. Boston. Side corner at the knees, 2-2. Two two. Red Sox with the highest on base percentage in the American League. I don't think as many home runs. It's going to reach 100 barely this year, it looks like. Well, they leave a lot of men on base, the Red Sox. Gallego throws Dwight Evans out as we throw it to Gail Gardner in our studios in New York. All right, Bob, after trailing 3 0, the Cubs have taken the lead over the Pirates. Sean Dunstan with the base hit off John Smiley drops in front of Andy Van Slyke. Lloyd McClendon scoring from second. The Cubs now lead the Pirates 4 3 in the fourth. Let's go back to Fenway. So these Cubbies, in pursuit of their seventh straight win, a week ago today, they were two innings away from relinquishing the lead to the Cardinals. And they just blew the entire division open, winning two straight head-to-head -head against St. Louis to finish that series, sweeping Montreal. They virtually eliminated the entire division in the space of four or five days. And would you trade any two middle infielders, any tandem for Dunstan and Sandberg at this point? Remember the first couple of months, they were looking to get rid of Dunstan. They were trying to about run him out of town. Grand slam yesterday. He's going, as Zimmer says, from third base past second base, catching everything in sight. They both run. They're both hitting with some power now. Dunstan and Sandberg turning the double play. Ooh. Sandberg's got, what, 30 home runs and about yeah. half of them in the last six, seven weeks. Greenwell with a one-out walk, the third given up by Storm Davis. Throw in. Jerome Walton in center, you're talking about the strength up the middle of Jimmy Fry wanting to build that Cubs team around. Early in his career, Storm Davis pitched a respectable number of complete games. He has only one this year in 27 starts. Sasky drives one toward right center. Conseco got a late break. It bounces in front of him, then he botches the ball. Greenwell headed for third. He's Conseco coming. then falls down. Greenwell coming home with Sasky to third. Game tied. Conseco did about everything you can do wrong on a single ball. Henderson counseling him. He got a late break. Then he didn't feel the hop. Then he fell down. He wasn't sure if he could try for kind of a backhanded shoestring catch, and then the ball got him so quickly, he didn't get a good hop, and he's all over the place. I'm assuming it's going to be a base hit, probably a double and an air charge to Conseco. Isaski's bat becomes very important in this ball club. I think they've all got to try and re-sign him if he wants to stay here. Infield's in now, Bob. Especially the possibility of Jim Rice's career, you know, that elbow. Maybe he's not able to continue if they do ask him back. Yeah. 
59. It's a double, an error. No RBI for Asaski. The lights are on, but I don't think it had any effect on that ball getting lost in this cloudy day in the lights. Couldn't get his footing. Whoa. One pitch hit deep to right. Let's see what the wind does with it. Conseco over to the warning track to make the catch. Asaski tags. And the Red Sox lead 2-1. to one. He can't believe it. I mean, he hit the heck out of that ball. And the ball looked like it was almost hovering over the short right field foul pole and going to be in by a number of rows. And then it just keeps coming back. Look at Conseco. He starts back and then has to reverse and come in. The ball looked like it's going to be about 15 rows in. He gets a no time at bat RBI sack fly out of it. And the Red Sox with just one hit. The Saskies double a moment ago now have a two to one lead. Rivera's fly ball should then end the inning and Ricky Henderson does the honors. Suddenly Davis trails two to one after four and we're back after these messages from your local station. The game of the week is brought to you by Mitsubishi Motors who invites you to come see the full line of cars and trucks. Mitsubishi, suddenly the obvious choice. And by Old Milwaukee and Old Milwaukee Life. It doesn't get any better than this. So Dobson has the lead for the first time as we move on to the fifth. It's 2-1 Red Sox. Gallego steps in, drops a bunt down. Boggs lets it roll, and it goes foul. And Latchman is trying to claim. He touched it? That he touched it and fell in fair territory while it was on the chalk. But Dale I, Ford, the third base umpire, isn't buying it. Wade waited until the ball, ball just started trickling foul. And then he watched you back off like a bullfighter. And he waits. Didn't touch it at all. Actually, Latchman's claim might have been the other way around. After he missed it, he might have been saying to Dale Ford, in case this thing kicks fair, he never touched it. If it goes fair before the bag, don't make the call too quickly. Get the points, my man. But all moot. Mm -hmm. The pitch. Diego sends one to right center, and it's Danny Heath. You know, this Oakland team, and Merv Rettman is the hitting coach for the athletics, they have all kinds of meetings. It's just not pitchers and catchers and pitching coach. They have a lot of hitters meetings. In fact, I think that starts way back when Charlie Lau was the hitting instructor, the White Sox, and La Russa was there as the manager. So they go, everything a guy throws, what he throws in certain situations, comes through their computer system. They are a very thorough organization under Sandy Almerson. Ricky, a single, a ground out, a pair of stolen bases, and a run scored. And the reason I say that, you can already say with a great sinker ball that Dobson's had, they're starting to try and wait for the ball to get over the plate and hit it the opposite way because they keep pounding the ball in the dirt when they pull it. The error by Conseco figured in the two-run Boston fourth, and one of the two runs is unearned. takes a seat and doesn't just glare he yells out at Dobson yeah in that situation he's not going to throw close to him there are some teams and look at Dobson's yelling back at him and Haas has got to stop Ricky because Rick Sarone said something also Rick saying get in the batter's box the catcher Dobson yelled in and now Latch has got to come in and, and try and settle Ricky Henderson down 2-0 oh, they weren't coming in on him to try and hit him now, there are some teams when they have their scouting report to try and get Ricky Henderson out of his crouch. Early in the ball game will straighten him up. I mean, he gets thrown at as much as anybody, not just the sluggers. He has some big hot dogs. He puts his head in the strike zone, tries to work the count. 3-0 pitch. He's not, a, he's not a guy you want to fool around. Now he's on base, and he's saying, all right, pal, now who's got who? Uh-huh. Remember, Henderson and Cerrone occupied the same clubhouse for several years with the Yankees. You have to figure they're well acquainted. Well, Ricky's already got two stolen bases in this ballgame. He stole second, he stole third with 
Lansford followed him in the first inning. And I don't think he'll wait too long. Sasky holds him on. Dobson chases him back. You know, Ricky's the kind of guy who's been known to rub teammates as well as opponents the wrong way, so it's very possible that there's no love lost to begin with between Cerrone and Henderson. Not going. Outside and low. Yeah, but Dobson sped up his delivery, thinking he might be. Missed the strike zone by three feet. Now, what it does is it's not just terrorize a pitcher and a catcher, but it makes those two middle infielders crowd closer to the second base bag because they're going to have to get a throw if you attempt to steal. And when you crowd closer, the ball sneaks through. Inside, 2-0 to Lansford, who has an infield hit and a ground out and is hitting 337 at this moment. Tops in the American League since Kirby Puckett at 336 doesn't play until tonight. If he does lose Lansford to a walk, you can almost give the walk to Ricky Henderson at first base. pitch good runners pitch there he goes and it's grounded foul I think the first man ever to say it was Billy Martin he said many many years ago when he had Ricky in Oakland that the best leadoff hitter of all time and I guess you can't prove it with the change in the style of baseball but the best leadoff hitter of all time might be that guy right there you have to consider the pace when you look at Henderson here mm -hmm. barring injury he'll zoom past Lou Brock in far fewer games lifetime and when people have called him the best leadoff man they're considering a variety of things not only his stolen base totals but his brash personality the disruptive force that he is there he goes, and there's a walk, so he can slow down. Plus, he has the rare combination of speed and power. He has 20 home run a year power, and he gets a lot of walks. High so base percentage. percentage is very high. He maintains pretty good slugging percentage, too. Extra base hits. And because of all those offensive statistics, you overlook the fact that there are times when Ricky Henderson plays left field as well as anybody. Throwing arm not the best, but boy, he can go get the ball. I guess that's why the Yankees and Billy Martin put him in center field in spacious Yankee Stadium a few years ago. And really what's happening here is if there's going to be some changes in signs, Rivera wants to know. And also, not to pay too much attention to Ricky, but how can you avoid it? Dennis Lamp now. Dobson has walked three, the last two back-to-back -back here with one out in the fifth. The Red Sox lead two to one. The lights are on and a few raindrops have fallen within the last 10 minutes or so. Reed snuck in behind Henderson, but Dobson just steps off the rubber. This, of course, is an official game if the Red Sox get out of this half inning with the lead. But they'll wait forever before calling this. Considering its pennant race implications for the A's. Here they go. Cerrone's throw. Out. Oh, man, what a measure of satisfaction Rick Cerrone is going to take in this. LaRusso is going to come out and have a little discussion with Dale Ford. You know, I'm not so sure that he's arguing that he, whether he was out or safe, I wonder if he's saying that he pitched too quickly and may have balked and unloaded. I don't know. Of course, any of the four umpires can call the balk. It's too late now. This is the 13th time that Henderson has been caught stealing overall this year. 
He has swiped 67. To put it in perspective, Maury Wills was thrown out 13 times the year he stole 104. The year he stole 118 to break Wills' record. Lou Brock was thrown out 37 times. Then in 1982, when Henderson stole 130, which is still the existing record, they got Ricky better than 40 times. With Cerrone getting him here, 19 of 23 times now after he's tagged out here has Ricky Henderson been successful stealing third base. The hand was pretty close to being on the bag and the tag is up on the forearm. It's a very, very close call. Unorthodox with Canseco up to even attempt to steal, but Ricky's success ratio has been so phenomenal at third base, this time it backfires. But you can't hold a guy like that down no matter who's hit. Great throw by Cerrone. Lansford, meanwhile, is at second. But with two out. Perhaps Jody Reed taking one step away from them, jockeying back and forth. And Wade did look like he got the tag down just as the left hand was about to touch the bag. Two balls and a strike. Three and one. The A's are not only the defending league champions, but remember, they swept the Red Sox four straight in the playoffs. And in Henderson and this guy, Conseco, they have the kind of players that visiting fans can easily develop into villains. You know, the opposing team's fans are very likely to get on a Henderson or a Conseco. Ooh. Popped almost straight up. We got a hanging slider. Eventually, by <laughs> nightfall, it's in Bob's glove. Man. An eventful but scoreless. and Dale Ford in a civil but continuing conversation. Well, the barrister's going to go back, and perhaps that's why he does not get thrown out of games much. He knows how to approach the umpire as if he's in a courtroom. There's Merv Rettman, the hitting coach. So the Red Sox fans took special glee in a half inning in which Henderson was cut down stealing and Canseco popped up with a man in scoring position. There's a curve that drops into Romine. As we start the last half of the fifth, the A's trailing here two to one are one for ten with men in scoring position. Cleveland and Toronto remain tied at two in the seventh at the Sky Dome and that misses low. Dawson's homer came earlier in the game. R.J. Reynolds also has one for the Pirates, who now lead Chicago 5-4. Cubs have won six straight. Bob Welch and Storm Davis are the two best starting pitchers on the Oakland A staff on getting the first pitch strike, which Dave Duncan emphasized. And you just saw that first pitch strike, a change-up curveball to get ahead of the hitter. You do with the fastball. He usually saves the fork ball for a little later on the count for a strikeout pitch. There it was. You know, the thing that impresses you about Storm Davis, you know, he used to have some control problems. He was going to be the next Jim Palmer. He started before today 65 games for the Athletics. And over those 65 starts, the team is 46 and 19. And a lot of that is Dave Duncan and Larusa know when to get a pitcher out before they get beaten the pot. And of course, you got to have a good bullpen, which they have, to be able to do that. Here's the 2 2 pitch. Toward the right field line with Canseco in pursuit. He doesn't get it. And Romine is held to a single. Only the second hit off Davis. Sasaki had a double in the fourth. The wind cost Heap a home run in that fourth inning. Settled for a sacrifice fly on a ball that was really crushed into the right field corner. Romine gets behind in the count. Then he goes with the pitch and got a pitch upstairs away. Now the defensive alignment, you can see Canseco being brought in, moved toward the line for Cerrone. Cerrone goes for the sacrifice. McGuire fields it, Phillips covers. So that puts Romine in scoring position with Boggs and Reed given a chance to pick him up. Pass the out to remind Storm Davis who's hitting a man who, until this last road trip, 
where everything fell apart for the Red Sox, one of the best in the game. Hitting with men in scoring position, and he's alerting that first base is open. With Jody Reed up next, the right-hander, and then Evans. That's strike one. The eight-game losing streak the Red Sox snapped last night behind Roger Clemens was their longest since 1977, but they have won 12 of their last 15 home games. Ball and a strike. Their last two victories have been at the expense of the A's. Fastball high, and Hassey trying to settle Davis down a little bit. Today's pitcher, Dobson, for the Sox, won the first game of the road trip at Oakland. Then the Red Sox proceeded to lose the next eight in succession as they staggered home before Clemens beat the A's again last night. He's just staying after with all fastballs and only one in the strike zone, and that was close. And Hassey keep, kept looking into the dugout and for a little subtle sign from LaRusso whether or not he wants to pitch around him. his second walk he grounded a first in between his average stays at 330 now, the hundred walks are going to be there he needs one more it's getting those 13 hits to get 200 base hits for bonds especially with a bad elbow and knee and not only to get the 200 hits but obviously he covets that sixth batting title and he's seven points back of Lansford and six behind Puckett Reed has flied to center, flied to left. Ball one to him. Let's see if it happens, but so many times when you pitch around a guy and you purposely throw four pitches out of the strike zone, not an intentional walks, you change your release point, and now Storm Davis is going to try and get it back on Jody Reed. He's falling behind. Yeah. Hit the opposite way, base hit, Conseco charging. He can throw. And the runners are stopped. The bases are loaded. Bases loaded for Dwight Evans. And there are not too many people in the game who hit with the bases loaded like this guy. He has a strong throwing arm. He charges well. Not playing very deeply for Jody Reed. In 17 plate appearances with the bases loaded. Evans is 12 RBIs. Two sack flies, two home runs, two base on balls. Todd Burns gets up now mm -hmm. in Tony LaRusso's bullpen. Duncan, the pitching coach, to the mound. As we mentioned earlier, Davis has thrown only one complete game this year. Only four complete games in the last four seasons. It's not because he couldn't if we were the different team, but when you got Eckersley to close and when they had Cattery and Plunk before they went to the Yankees. Honey cut down there. Matt Young was 20, the left-hander. Well, Davis had 10 complete games for Baltimore in 1984, eight the next year. Well, the makeups of the staffs are different. LaRusso and Duncan use their pens more because it's been so good. And here's Evans. Five career grand slams, two of them this year from the windup. Outside and low, 1 0. Davis has been struggling with his control. Evans has a great eye and loves to work pitchers into those 2 0, 3 1 holes and then sit on something. Swings at the 1 0 pitch, rolls it slowly to short. Diego boots it. A run scores and the bases remain loaded. and made three errors in yesterday's ball game. Seeing if they will score that an error at this point. You not ordinarily see Evans go after pitches like this when he's ahead in the count. One ball and no strikes. Pitch down and away. Tried to pull it. He's six. Greenwell swings at the first one, hits it hard to center field. Henderson tracks it down, Boggs tags and scores. The throw comes into third to keep the other runners in check. 
That's one of those where the runner of second's got to tag up also. And at least force the throw and the outfielders on the move. You might create a first and third where you can score an infield hit. A lot of terrific situation hitters on this club. Boggs, Evans, Greenwell is excellent. And Sasky, by watching these guys, become the same kind of hitter. So it's four to one. And half of Boston's four runs are unearned. As Canseco and Gallego have made very harmful errors. Dave Duncan before the ball game, and there have been errors yesterday and today, but he was a little concerned about the pitching. He said we pitched so well all year until just recently. And he couldn't think of put his finger on why. Pressure and pennant pressure now, and so much of this team's lead has come because their pitching staff's been so good all year, and there's been a lot of pressure on them all year long to pick up for all the injuries. When you look at Asaski with 26 home runs, the quick judgment is he's taken advantage of the wall, and he may have, in a certain sense. That gets away from Hasse. He can't find it. The runners move up. And then Reed, after a wide turn, decides he'll be content to stop at third. And Hassey, well, it rattled off his protective cut because the ball bounced way out in front of him. He overthrew a curveball. And Hassey couldn't get down on it or didn't get down on it. It's Barry Weinberg, the trainer, who's had his work all year long, along with Tony LaRusso. Overthrows a curveball, and Hassey just didn't stay down. Caused himself more than a few problems. Meanwhile, no matter how much it hurts, the ball's still in play. And Hassey forces himself to chase it to the screen. This is not fun. When Pudge Fisk was playing for the Red Sox, going out seriously, he had an injury like this that really set him back about a month and a half or two months. So he just couldn't play. Weinberg works on Hassett. We tell you about the work we'll be doing on the football side tomorrow, beginning with NFL Live at 12.30 Eastern Time. Followed by these games, Miami and New England, the Raiders and Kansas City. That, of course, was once one of the great rivalries in the old American Football League and in the early days of the AFC. Pittsburgh, Cincinnati. In years gone by, you'd say, well, that's an important playoff-type game in the AFC Central, but Pittsburgh is really struggling, losing 51-0 at home last Sunday to the Browns, and the Browns are home against the Jets. Bud Carson, the new head coach of Cleveland, of course, the former defensive coordinator for Joe Walton in New York. And the late games, Indianapolis and the Rams, Dickerson's first game mm -hmm. against John Robinson and his former teammates, and Houston against San Diego in San Diego chance to see an old friend at the ballpark yesterday Harvey Green used to be the PR director for the Yankees now with Miami waiting for Don Shula and the team to come up I think they're coming in today we asked Harvey how many years he worked for George Steinbrenner he said three but you count them like dog years <laughs> each one is worth seven in normal human terms so I count it as 21 Now with Joe Robbie, Don Shula, and the Dolphins. Hassey recovers, and, and a little joke, which we'll tell you about after this pitch. Do you see that motion toward Davis? He flashed the sign, and then he lifted his hand as ball if to up. say, come on, just keep the ball up. I don't want to have to go through this again. Isaski's been a pretty good hitter this year. With two outs and runners in scoring position. Called strike three. This time. And that's Davis's first strikeout. But he's on the short end after five, four to one. Although only one of the two runs the Red Sox got in the fifth is officially earned. There are two RBIs in the inning. Evans, who reached on Gallego's error at short, does get an RBI because a run would have scored from third, even had he been thrown out. 
And then Greenwell followed with a sacrifice fly for which he gets credit for an RBI. Dave Parker, back-to-back -back National League batting titleist in 77 and 78 for the Pirates. Hit over 330 each time. He's a 295 career hitter. The bat is shattered in two. And Jody Reed throws to Asaski to retire Parker, opening the sixth. So Dave is now 0 for 3, having grounded a second all three times. And that hard sinker ball will do this to you if a hitter, along with those light bats. You see the movement on that ball, Bob, not only going away, but it's dropping off the table like the Titanic. Good looking sinker. Dave Henderson deprived of a hit on a good play by Boggs in the first. Then he doubled the left center in the fourth. And that's high to him. Red Sox trying to make it two in a row over Oakland and active spoilers leading 4-1. John Dobson looking for his 11th win of the year against seven defeats. Balls behind Dave Henderson, 3-0. Well, they've had him in trouble, Dobson, this entire ball game with men on base. Many times, it's been, a couple times they've been the leadoff hitter and Joe Morgan doesn't like the looks at it. He's kept his bullpen going. After the two walks last inning, if not for Cerrone, he probably would have been out of there last inning. Cerrone thrown out Henderson. There's the situation. Toronto and Cleveland tied 2-2 now in the seventh at the Sky Dome. Toronto feels very comfortable in that big ballpark now. When they first moved in, the hitters might have been a little bit leery of the wind and the spaciousness of it in center field. Oh, they're playing very well up there. Dobson has not had a 1-2-3 inning yet. Check swing roll it a short. Rivera to Asaski. It was close. Oh, right. But they get Henderson hustling all the way. You know, I just saw three ball games. Tom Kelly's Minnesota Twins. And they've got some young pitchers now came over to Viola. Viola deal. He almost takes too much time here. Puts it over the top and gets it by half a stride. But boy, Tapani, Tapani and West. Look at Guthrie through the organization along with Aguilera. Got some good arms there. And boy, the Twins are playing just like they did a couple of years ago at home. Oakland's got to go there. As he's walked and was retired on a comebacker. Down and away to him. He's hit five home runs this year. Began the day hitting 238. Dobson threw that last pitch. Looked like he tried to change up, and he looked immediately into the dugout. <laughs> a little bit of sign that he start, He thinks he's losing it. Getting the ball upstairs. He had 10 ground ball outs to the first four innings, Dobson did. Then a couple of walks pop up. He's got two more in the sixth. This is Dobson's 25th start, and he, like his opponent today, Storm Davis, has completed only one. And some of that because of Rob Murphy having a good year and Lee Smith who's had a good year when he's had the chance to come in and save ball games. And the rain is picking up now in the sixth. You saw the standings a moment ago. The Orioles close with three at Toronto. The Royals finish with three at Oakland. But California has no more head-to-head -head games remaining against the A's. Three balls and a strike. Two out, nobody on top of the sixth. 4-1 Boston. Took a rip, didn't get it. Red Sox got two in the fourth, two in the fifth. After the A's opened the run in the top half of the first. One run in each of Boston's scoring innings was unearned. Well hit center field. But it's spacious out there. Romine drifts into left center to make the catch. As the wind moved the ball over on it. That's the first time Dobson has retired the A's in order. Jim Pearsall did his high wire act on that 35 foot high Fenway Park wall in left field many years ago. 
for the benefit of our younger viewers, would you like to clarify that as a breaking ball is lined by Heap over the leaping Phillips for a leadoff single to start the bottom half of the sixth. That was before the book Fear Strikes Out in the movie. And Jimmy had his mental problems and was squirting umpires with a squirt gum from behind the stands and doing a high wire act trying to make the Barnum and Bailey circus walking the wall out there. This helps some players, but it's hurt some. Those line drive hitters have hit a lot of balls off that the fly ball hitters can get the ball up on the screen. This year, the Red Sox have not taken advantage of their home field situation. Jeff Stone has gone in to run now. As well as they have in the past, they used to have, in an average year, a much better winning percentage at home and on the road. In fact, last year, they had a winning streak in the vicinity of 20 at home as they marched to the championship in the American League East. And this year especially, they haven't hit the long ball here. Lansford in close on the grass. I think they're trying to find out something about Jeff Stone and the Red Sox organization. He's had a little slight hamstring pull. But they're trying to find out, and yesterday they put him in right field for defensive reasons. He's never been known for that. They know he's got speed. Perhaps they're looking for him as a leadoff hitter next year, and if he can play defensively, the out. So they're trying to find out something for next season. The Red Sox farm system, many people feel, is pretty much dry. Uh, Luke Garman. This is Yawkey may go the free agent route. A town like Fenway, where they're expected to compete in this Eastern Division American League, uh, while as the fans have been, you've all you've got to go out and spend the money. They may have to. First one was Bruce Hurst, and they couldn't sign him. They had a pretty good pot of gold they could put back in the coffers treasury here and we may want to spend some of that next year Langston will be available not many left-handers come to Fenway by choice Bryn Smith a few others pulls back takes another ball three and oh quick check of the scoreboard they go to the eighth the Indians continuing to hang with the Blue Jays and Pittsburgh trying to snap the Chicago winning streak at six. San Diego at San Francisco. Padres moved to within five with a win last night. That one's rain delayed. Called strike. See if the situation changes with the speed of Stone at first. If they stay with the bond at three and one. If they start in a hit and run. Rivera's got pretty good bat control. It looks like he might have been leaning. Romine is on deck. And then Sarone. He got him. Yep. Goodbye. He was gone. He committed too soon. Al Bumbry, the first base coach, had had a couple of conversations with Stone about Storm Davis' move. And he makes the first false step. The hit and run was going to be on, and he's dead. embarrassing when you're a pinch runner. Now the 3-1 pitch. And he walked him, so Stone might have taken the Red Sox out of a potentially big inning. Storm Davis might be the aptly named pitcher for the kind of day this is about to become. The wind has really picked up. It's drizzling. The umbrellas have popped out around Fenway. Some dark, ominous clouds overhead. If we get through this one without a rain delay, we'll consider ourselves lucky. And if it rains, it's going to all blow in here, the way the wind is coming. had a single to start the two-run fifth his last time up. That's a feeler. That sign was relayed from Dave Duncan or La Russa to Hassey to step off to see if there's going to be a play on if he's going on this. 
They were trying to read the base runner Rivera. And that may have been what got Stone in trouble. La Russa is studying as you hold the ball, you step off. You see if there's a tendency for the man to change his approach at first base. 2-0. The Red Sox are just six games over 500 at home. Normally they have a much greater advantage on the visitors. Matt Young getting ready, the left-hander. 2-0 pitch. Hit hard, left center base hit. Rivera around second, oh. stumbles a little bit. Henderson's oh, throw no. could be close. In there. And moving up behind him is Romine. It was a very close play, and it wasn't the fact that he, he didn't throw the wrong base, but you've got to keep the ball down in this area, so at least your shortstop set up in the cutoff position can decoy and freeze the runner at first to base to keep the double play in order. But Ricky throws it all the way on the fly, and misses the cutoff man completely where he couldn't decoy the runner, and Romine read it very well and kept on coming to the second base. La Russa trudging to the mound, and we might see Matt Young. Earlier, Todd Burns was throwing. Signals with the left hand. Cerrone is the next scheduled hitter. Davis is done. Leaving in the sixth, already down, 4-1. to one. This relief break brought to you by Rolades. And this week's American and National League leaders in the Rolades Relief Man Award standings look like this. Mark Davis, the Padre left-hander, is running away with it. All those blown saves have hurt Mitch Williams of the Cubs because points are deducted in that category. So Davis has opened a huge gap. In the American League, Jeff Russell of Texas leads the league with 34 saves. Eckersley is second overall. Eck is the defending Rolaids Relief Man winner, but the time on the disabled list cost him this year. Otherwise, you'd have to believe he'd be in front. Matt Young in his 17th relief appearance. He's had four starts for the Oakland Ball Club. And you know, Bob, that Tommy John operation has become, I won't say routine, but so familiar to so many people with Tudor having it and Daly having it from the Cardinals that. You hardly even talk about it anymore, but Matt Young missed like a whole year. Elbow reconstruction. They have a great slider. Ooh. Perhaps that great hard slider is what was doing with elbow in. So here's an interesting strategic choice mm -hmm. by Tony La Russa. He could have left Storm Davis in to pitch to one more man, the right-handed hitting Cerrone. First base is open, but obviously they want to come right at Cerrone because Boggs is the next hitter. Or he could have had a right-hander come in and get Cerrone or try to, and then uh, he probably would have pinched at Gedman, but Gedman struggled all year long. You'd probably prefer that matchup and then bring in Young, so he must feel Young with a little bit of a fork ball now. He sinks the ball more than he did. He just ride his fastball with the slider. He can get the ground ball. The infield's going to have to come in. Rack slider just has a talk with his hitter. Rack comes down from third base. Cerrone is 250 overall, but he's under 200 on the road and 333 in better than 100 at-bats at Fenway. Was that trip by Snyder just to throw the thought of a squeeze play into the mind of the Oakland defense? They're weighing. Cerrone's 0 for 1 with a sacrifice. He takes a strike. For the pickoff of Jeff Stone, the pinch runner, this could truly be a gruesome inning for Tony La Russa and the A's. It's bad enough already as they trail four to one. Inside one and one. Each team has five hits, but the A's have made two errors. So two of the four Boston runs are unearned. And the A's have squandered a lot of scoring opportunities. They're one for ten with men in scoring position today. Two balls and a strike. <laughs> Hit in the air to left center field. It'll get a run home, maybe more. Dave Henderson chasing it to the track. 
He makes the catch. A run shoves home. Both Danny Heat and Rick Cerrone were looking for that summer breeze blowing out the left instead of almost straight in because Cerrone crunches one to left center field in a two and one pitch. Rivera scored. Romine might have been able to tag and move up to third, but he played it halfway in case the ball got over Henderson's head. Which so is Cerrone not. gets the RBI. If it gets over his head, if you stand on the back tagging up, you're still going to score unless it bounces right back to him, so he should be on third base. A strike to Boggs. I can remember Boggs saying, this was before Matt Young's arm miseries, but a couple of years ago when asked which pitcher gave him the most trouble, Boggs said Matt Young. Well, he had that Gidry, Carlton, Sparky Loud kind of slider. Breaks late, breaks quickly. Boggs couldn't catch up to that one, and he's behind 0-2. If he gets a hit, he'll be at 332. If he's retired, he'll stay officially at 330 which is where he is right now, 0 for 1 with two walks. Began the day at 331, takes outside 1 and 2. Reaches for it, pokes it to Phillips, it comes up nicely for him. Boggs is 0 for 2, but the Red Sox chase Storm Davis, tack on another run, leave 5-1, and we're back after these messages from your local station. Bob Costa's back at Fenway. The drizzle continues. We move on to the 7th. The Red Sox leading 5-1 and on the verge of beating the A's for the second straight time. This is two games into the final road trip of the year for Tony La Russa's team. They'll play 10 on the road before finishing at home. This is not the time for a team that's leading the division with Kansas City and California State to have their offense, their defense, and their pitchers starting to go sour. You can get away with it sometimes at home when you've got your last at bats where there's less pressure. When you're going to Cleveland with their pitching staff and their new manager and Minnesota on that turf, Tom Kelly's young pitching staff and Herbeck and fucking Gaetti. Gaetti may be back by then. I'll tell you, they're going to have a struggle. They're going to have a struggle. Uh, that Kansas City series could become very important. If the A's hold Kansas City off, F. Stone is the new right fielder replacing Danny Heap. And Dobson's gone. Dennis Lamp, the new pitcher, as we move to the seventh. If they hold off Kansas City, they might have the Detroit Tigers to thank for it. It's inexplicable, but the Tigers have owned Kansas City, especially at Tiger Stadium. And about a week ago, just after the Tigers had lost 12 straight, they swept the three-game set against the Royals. Beat Brett Saberhagen in the first game. Who could figure it? Still, Kansas City bounced back. Didn't go into a swoon after that. But if they get close and fall just short, they'll look to that three-game sweep in Detroit as they're undoing late in the year. Owen to McGuire. Phillips and Gallego scheduled next here in the seventh. I don't think McGuire is seeing quite as many off-speed pitches and breaking balls. He's seeing a lot more hard stuff. He came up with that uppercut as a pretty good breaking ball off-speed hitter. Little number. Lamp has it. McGuire's 0 for 3. Began the day hitting 227, but with the good power numbers, 26 homers, 83 RBIs. Last year, he had 32 and 99. And, of course, in 87, he set the rookie record with 49 home runs. A few people have abandoned their seats at Fenway. Others sit through the rain. You can Phillips see, takes a strike. See that little pattern on the pitcher's mound. Then groundskeeper Joe Mooney. It's a little more clay where the pitcher steps so it doesn't break up. And you can see that little fanned out pattern where the pitchers will stride. Keeps the pitcher's mound in better shape than if it was that lighter brown dirt. And 
get bigger holes and you have to have more repair works done. Phillips grounded a second his last time up, snapping a string of hits in seven consecutive official at-bats spread over four games. Two and one. And a lot of the little people have helped keep this team close. Well, the stars were out. People out of the bullpen and the Phillips and the Gallegos and Lansford, who had such an atrocious second half with injuries last year, has helped get on base a lot since the All-Star break. Easy hop for Reed over to Asaski. Two out in the Oakland seventh. Well, where are we likely to be? You and me, Vin and Tom, the last Saturday of the regular season. San Diego plays against San Francisco. Maybe the Padres can creep close enough to make those season-ending games meaningful. The Cubs are in St. Louis, and it looked for a while as if that would mean everything, but the Cardinals have plummeted while the Cubs have surged. Still, if the Cards can get to within three by the final weekend, and they start today six out, then that series would be meaningful. The Orioles are at Toronto, and the Royals are at Oakland. Well, let's see where Keith Hernandez bat got going a little bit after some turmoil in New York. Hernandez and Carter have not been playing. Hernandez has been patient, but Carter has spoken out against Davey Johnson. But with that pitching staff, where Hernandez being like he is, and Jeffries come along and all else, it's now Strawberry's hurt, but doggone, that team could run off some ball games in a hurry with that staff. We'll talk about Mets of a different vintage, the 62 Mets on the characters of the game segment. Coming up after this half inning, well, Hassey took a painful blow a few minutes ago and now it's Sarone who's writhing around sinker ball or pitchers will do that to you hit on the top of the ball a lot Two and two to Gallego with two out, nobody on. Top half of the seventh, 5-1 Boston. Called strike three. So Lamp comes in, works a snappy seventh inning. And it brings us to another edition of Characters of the Game. Characters of the Game. Brought to you by A&W. Sit back and try yourself an A&W root beer or cream soda. It was kind of a, a, a let's go see what happens today idea with the fans there, and, and we showed them plenty. <laughs> the 1962 Mets were so bad, they were adored. With the lovable Casey Stengel at the helm, this band of characters managed 120 losses that fabled summer, a modern-day record. The original Mets featured the likes of Roger Craig, their ace. He'd lead the league with 24 losses. Then there was Choo Choo Coleman, who couldn't remember his teammates' names, so he just called them by their number. And marvelous Marv Thronberry, who once tripled and then was called out for failing to touch first and second. Yes, the 1962 New York Mets were indeed characters of the game. I say that I touched first base, but I might have missed second. <laughs> Fans scattering at Fenway as the rain picks up. They haven't stopped play at any point yet. It is, of course, an official game as we move to the last half of the seventh. Red Sox leading 5-1. Todd Burns out of the Oakland bullpen, missing high and away to Jody Reed. Burns has thrown 77 innings in relief this year, the most relief innings on the Oakland staff. He's had two starts to make it a total of a little over 89 innings, but it's because of guys like Todd Burns who they got started last year, tried him last year, they could get rid of Plunkett and Cataray. They knew he could do the job, and they traded the Yankees when they knew they had to get Ricky Henderson, because at that time, they weren't sure how quickly Conseco's wrist was going to get well. And they wanted an extra offensive punch from Henderson. They could give some of those relievers they had who were successful, because they knew about Burns. Burns 2-1 pitch to Jody Reed. He goes the opposite way again for another base hit. He's two for four. He's single to right field each of his last two trips. He's one of Johnny Pesky's favorite players. He likes a little infielder. He likes the way he handles the bat. You can butt with him. You can hit and run with him. Not 
great speed, but he might sneak off on occasion and steal a base for you. Husky, of course, been a coach for the team. He's in uniform before ball games at home. Evans now taking high. He's officially 0 for 3, but he did pick up an RBI on his ground ball to short in the fifth, which was booted by Gallego, but even had it been handled cleanly, a run would have scored. As you know, this telecast is presented by authority of Major League Baseball, may not be reproduced or retransmitted in any form without the express written consent of Major League Baseball. Evans has 18 home runs. One and one to him. So you talk about bullpens and the way LaRusse and Dunkel handle it. They really know how to portion innings out. They don't blow people away out of the bullpen. I mean, they, they ration the innings of Dennis Eckley. They had last year and again this year. Waits on it, drives it to center. Dave Henderson backs up, comes in, and has it. LaRusse is great on matchups. Law degree and studying the computers. Still 2-2 in the ninth. The Sky Dome. Farrell and Steve were the starters in that Indians Blue Jays game. The Pirates continue to lead the Cubs and they still haven't started at Candlestick. Speculation that next season, John Hart, the interim manager, at least till the end of the season, replacing Doc Edwards, the former Red Sox manager and the old friend of Hank Peters, the GM in Cleveland. Will McNamara end up there? McNamara now advanced scouting for Seattle. Greenwell with an opposite field hit. Henderson picks it up. Reed jockeying around second base trying to draw a throw, but Ricky just holds it and looks him back. The Red Sox have two on with one out. Greenwell now officially one for two in four plate appearances with a walk and a sacrifice fly thrown in. Boston has seven hits. The A's have five. He's asking the kind of hitter that the Red Sox for years looked for in young players. Big, strong, stand up on the plate, hit from the right side, able to pull the ball into that wall. And the philosophy of some of the hitters in this ballpark has changed recently. To his left, Lansford. Whoa, he throws the ball away. It'll be the third error. The He's bases are loaded. Ooh. Phillips turned because Reed had rounded the bag too far. Had he picked it up and thrown immediately, he might have been able to throw behind him. Ball might have been a little bit slick. Lansford picked it up off the wet grass. E5, boy, so he had three errors yesterday and three today. They're out of the inning if they play it cleanly because it's an easy double play. Mm. You know, that wasn't as bad a throw as it looks at that replay. Phillips so intent of coming across the bag if he's there and anchored, we can go right, left. I bet you that ball is not that far inside of the bat. When you play with different second basemen, Gallego's been there at times. They want the ball in different spots. And I think Phillips made that throw look a lot worse than it really was. And the air still goes to Lance for infield in now. Jeff Stone, the hitter, occupying the place of Danny Heap for the batting order. And that's why they're in with one out. You know, he's not very likely to hit into a double play with that speed from the left side. Stone, as you see, stands far off the plate and then strides into the ball, takes a strike, one and one. Bases loaded, one out, last half of the seventh. Red Sox already leading 5-1 to one and threatening to blow it open. Burns throws it past Stone, 1-2. and two. You know, I think to a degree, and I guess that's why I Dave talking the question, to a degree, and they can always bounce back. But this Oakland team, with all the injuries and what they've had to do to be where they are, a little bit mentally burned out. It shows more on the road. And you have to try something to get them over that hump. You know, defensively, offensively, they're sluggish in almost every area. Oakland will have 15 games remaining after this one. They begin the day three and a half up on Kansas City and California. 
holds up. Count evens, two and two. Kansas City at Baltimore. Gubas out 15 and 10 against Jeff Ballard, 17 and 7. California at Chicago, McCaskill, 15 and 8 against Sean Hilligus, 6 and 10. The 2-2. Two -two. They come home with this. Phillips to Hasse, no chance at first on the speedy stone, and they take the force. The bases remain loaded with two out. Finger fastball, a little bit of sinking action. Just a straight sinker ball, I believe, or maybe a hard split. So Rivera. Oh, a vicious cut at a high, hard fastball. Rivera, 0 for 1 officially. He flied to right in the fourth. He's also walked twice. Shortstop Gallego. Phillips for the force. Phillips not happy with Jeff Stone, who slid in late and might have clipped him a little bit. Red Sox leave the bases loaded. It was a sunny and pleasant day when they threw the first pitch around 2.20 Eastern time. It has turned miserable, and since there's little at stake from the Red Sox perspective, many of the fans have bailed out. It means more than a little bit to Oakland, of course. You're talking about a Sasky being the prototypical Fenway player, especially under the Red Sox philosophy in the past. He's hit 26 home runs this year, but they're evenly divided. 13 here, 13 on the road. And as a team, surprisingly, the Red Sox have 52 away from Fenway, 45 here. Rob Murphy, the left-hander, he's had a good year. And Lee Smith, who's also had a good year. As you said earlier, Joe Morgan Fields will have enough offense, but it's a matter of getting those arms. And now, Oil Can Boyd, who is scheduled to pitch tomorrow, if he can come back for next year, he's shown some signs of coming back this year, not throwing as hard. He could help their starting rotation. There's the can. It's quite a story. Bob Welch, who's 116, will oppose him for Oakland. A ball and a strike to Ricky Henderson. If the A's are going to do something, you'd figure this to be the inning. Henderson, Lansford, Canseco. Dave Parker and Dave Henderson waiting behind them if anybody gets on base. Hit up the middle, but Reed had him played correctly and gets it. So between Dobson and Lamp now, 15 ground ball out. Remember Eddie Stanky? He used to give if a pitcher got 15, 16 ground ball outs. Joel Harlan was one of those, I recall. He used to give the new suit of clothes. Told him to keep the ball down. Let your infielders do the work. And boy, the Red Sox pitchers so far do they have. Lamp to Lansford inside. Infield hit, ground out, walk. In there, one and one. If Lansford gets a hit, he'll be at 339 and leading the league after this at bat. If they retire him, he's down to 336 and back in a tie with Kirby Puckett. Romine for the catch. So Lansford started the day at 336. He's gone one for three and he stays right where he was. You know, the MVP balloting is going to be interesting in the American League this year. You know, Lansford with that average, I guess you get a few votes. And if you look around, and George Dow and Toronto Freddie McGriff and Cal Ripken, Robin Young from Milwaukee. But, uh, the, the list is going to be narrowed down even further over this last two weeks. Sierra had a big first half. Jackson got 17 RBIs in his last 17 ball games. Look at those numbers. 
Or will it be a pitcher? The balance split. I don't believe a pitcher should be the MVP, but there's no clear-cut choice, unlike last year, when the guy at the plate, Canseco, was a unanimous selection. In this game, he struck out single and popped to third. Two out, nobody on in the eighth. 5-1 Red Sox. And a call, strike two. It's raining hard enough now where a game under ordinary circumstances in the middle of the year would be delayed. Maybe not called, but delayed. Now well, between innings, they took the little drying agent, threw it around. You can see it, the home plate and the pitcher's mound. Right field, Jeff Stone has it lined up. The A's go quietly in the eighth. We just get word from Three Rivers Stadium that Gary Reedus hit a three-run homer for the Pirates in the last of the seventh. They're still batting in that inning and leading the Cubs eight to four. At last report, the Indians and Blue Jays were tied at two in the ninth in the Sky Dome. Todd Burns for another inning of work. Sales one high to Kevin Romine, who'll be followed by Rick Cerrone and Wade Boggs. Wrapped to center. Henderson. Here's what's in store next week on NBC. This is the first I've found out about it. These are the games, huh? Uh-huh. So, Vin and Tom will be at Wrigley. The Pirates and the Cubs, they'll just switch locations. They're doing that game at Three Rivers right now. Cubs versus the Pirates there. And we'll be at Shea, the Expos and the Mets. Pre-game show, 2 Eastern time, next Saturday on NBC. Expos today have fallen eight games behind. They've lost five in a row. Mets have won a couple in a row. Perhaps by that next weekend, we'll be a little closer. Sarone. Plus, you won't have so far to travel to get back to your football show. Aside from that. Just a little cab ride. You got it. What are you, what are you calling that show this year? Uh, have you changed the name? I mean, I mean, not you. Have the people have to say so change the name of that show no it's still nfl live but there used to be an exclamation point after the live <laughs> now there's no punctuation at all it's a major change <laughs> the whole nation is a buzz about it Sarone checks his swing well, you know it's a whole new ball game this year <laughs> yeah you know i just i just play the hand i'm dealt big boy <laughs> ah you've been a good man in oj great storyteller The 2-2 pitch. Another chance for Dave Henderson in shallow center field. You know, for the first short time that Dave Henderson was in the Boston Red Sox, Red Sox uniform, he was a pretty big part of the history, wasn't he? Of this franchise. Whoa. Well, he hit the home run that turned the playoffs around in game five at Anaheim. And then he could have won the World Series with his home run to give him a lead in the top of the tenth at Shea Stadium in game six of the World Series. Later, Barrett and this guy at the plate, Boggs, got hits in that inning, produced an apparent insurance run. They're up 5-3, two outs, nobody on bottom of the 10th. And their entire world collapsed after that. Consequently, more people remember Mookie Wilson's ground ball going through Bill Buckner's legs, then Dave Henderson's homer off Rick Aguilera sailing over the fence and left. Now, here's Bob's story. He's 0 for 2, a pair of ground outs, plus two walks. If he gets a hit here, he's back to 331, which is where he began the day. If they retire him, he's at 329. Two and two. Can you imagine hitting him at 330? Do you see your lifetime batting average going down? Looks like he's going to be 0 for 3. Ricky Henderson. Boggs at 329. Lansford and Puckett each at 336. It's an upper crust crowd at Fenway. Yale umbrellas sprouting up. The pitch to the Cobra is a strike. Parker 0 for 3 and 265 for the year. 
followed by Dave Henderson and Ron Hassey. Last chance for Oakland, down 5-1, top of the ninth. Ripped foul into the remaining customers amid the steady rain at Fenway. To the, to the first five innings, the A's had a lot of scoring opportunities. They didn't cash in, but when Rick Cerrone threw Ricky Henderson out at third base, with Conseco up, that's been about it. And now, 10 consecutive batters have gone down. Dobson and now Lamp has picked it up. That came in the fifth, at which point Oakland trailed only two to one. They had first and second and only one out. They tried the double steal. Henderson was cut down. And the Red Sox assumed control of the game. Two outs from winning it as Parker goes over four. And we go to New York. Here's Gail. All right, Bob, it looks like the Pirates could be putting an end to the Cubs' six-game win streak. With two runners aboard, Gary Reedus takes Paul Ossenmacher deep to left field. Three-run homer, number six for Reedus. Pirates leading the Cubs now, eight to four in the eighth. Bob? Okay, Gail, and unless Oakland rallies here, when this game ends, we'll send you to Pittsburgh for the conclusion of that game. Dave Henderson, one for three, had a fourth inning double. Another part, important part of the ball game. He was on second base, and Hassey couldn't get the ball to the right side after attempting a sacrifice, brought it back to the pitcher, and they never scored Henderson. You know, that double by Henderson leading off the fourth is Oakland's last hit. It was their fifth and last. One out in the ninth. Lamp trying to put the finishing touches on a strong relief job. down the left field line and a fair ball home run for Dave Henderson it was really a funny sway because when he hit it ordinarily a ball like that hooks when you hit it that hard what a freaky swing at an inside pitch and it somehow stayed fair it had no hook whatsoever and into the pole Lamp had set down seven straight since entering the game to start the seventh Henderson breaks that string and it's forearm bash time, but the A's still trail. When the ball hit the bat, Henderson stood at home plate. Not to admire it, he thought it was going to hook foul also, and it just went straight as an arrow right into the screen. This Sink makes it ball five up. to two. Dobson and Lamp have kept the ball down very well, and a very few pitches have been up in that area until Dobson got a little tired. But they'd have 16 ground ball outs up until that home run. So the A's with one in the first, one in the ninth. Over Lamp, it's Rivera. Two gone. 17. 17 ground ball outs between Dobson and Lamp. The single runs in the first and the ninth are like bookends on the scoreboard for Oakland and nothing but goose eggs in between. <laughs> McGuire spanks one to left, but Greenwell is there as it hangs up for him. And that finishes it. McGuire is hitting under 200 in his last 170 or so at-bats. Hit that one hard, but still can't buy a break. Very sluggish A's team right now. The winner is Dobson. He's 11-7. and seven. The loser is Storm Davis. He's 17-7. and seven. The Red Sox have beaten the A's two straight. For Steve Horn and Tony Kubek, our director George Finkel, producer Ken Edmondson, I'm Bob Costas. Let's go to Pittsburgh.